Right, I think most people who are going to come are here, and it's right on the dot of six, so we might start and people can trickle in if necessary. <laughs> it's nice to see so many people here tonight. Welcome to a night in the John Oxley Library. I'm Ian Townsend, and I was a research fellow here at the JOL, and until recently I worked with ABC Radio National, but I'm now, I've now stopped doing that, and I'm writing a book, and I'm doing a PhD. Um, but tonight there are two other Queenslanders, both writing books, um, of a very different nature. My book's on 1942, but <laughs> these books are a bit more recent. Their books have to do with politics and the way political power, I suppose, is used and made. They're perfectly placed to talk to us tonight about something that re is really intriguing, I think. That's the way politics and democracy operates in Queensland. So the question is, is uh, Queensland's brand of democracy, I suppose, different? We're very conscious of being Queenslanders, of living in a distinct part of the country politically. I suppose other states feel the same way about themselves, but in Queensland we, we have some clear evidence, I think, for that distinctiveness when it comes to politics and uh, democracy. And I suppose if I think of uh, eras, if I think personally of eras in Queensland, they're closely tied to the political leaders that we're about. Um, so joining me are two people, two journalists, who have some really interesting insights into this because of their own experience and interest in the subject. Matt Condon is a Brisbane author and journalist, and you would all know about Matt. Um, you may have read his books. He's written quite a few. In recent years, he's um, been peeling back the, well, the Joe Biocchi peterson era and the years around it uh, with two books, Three Crooked Kings and Jackson Jokers, and a third in the trilogy is out soon, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, Loran Downer is, I suppose, I suppose, a political science and scientist and researcher and commentator, um, but She's, um, she's a, bit of, a bit of political history herself, really, in Queensland, because I knew Loran uh, when I worked at the ABC in the very early years when I was there, uh, started in the early 90s, and Loran was the uh, political reporter in Queensland in the 90s, so she witnessed quite a bit of uh, what's been happening in politics in Queensland and then uh, worked for the uh, Beattie and Bly governments in the media units. And, uh, and more recently, she helped develop the Vote Compass, you might remember, that project uh, for the last Queensland election. She does heaps of other stuff as well, including now writing a book about Kevin Rudd, Kevin 07, and political branding. Um, so that'll be interesting when that comes out. Um, just quickly, Lorraine, what is, the, what is the book about? It's about Kevin 07 specifically, or more generally about branding? Well, it's about Kevin 07 and also Julia Gillard in 2010, and it's focused on those two figures to talk about the um, use of political branding in Australian politics generally. So it's the way the, you know, politicians, I uh, suppose, use marketing techniques yeah. to, uh, well, I wouldn't say undermine, but exploit democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to think of it as connecting and communicating with voters. <laughs> <laughs> and they do it so well. But there's a, there are traps. Well, sometimes and yeah. sometimes not. <laughs> no, because it's not a science. It's an art, really, isn't it? It is and, an art. And Absolutely. They get, they get yeah. things wrong a lot. but. Mm -hmm. But although they've got it down pretty well down pat. So with the word democracy, you know, um, we should all know what it means. I suppose I haven't really thought about it too much over the years. He just accepted it as a word. I had a teacher who said it meant you know, mob rule, which I suppose is true. Um, what do we mean when we talk about democracy? Lorraine? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, a bunch of things. There are two quotes that... Um come to my mind. Um, one of them is from Oscar Wilde, which is perhaps at the cynical end of the um, spectrum. And for this, I need to thank my colleague, Chris Salisbury, for bringing it to my attention. Yeah. Um, democracy means simply the bludgeoning of the people, by the people, <laughs> for the people. <laughs> so I probably don't tend to that end of the spectrum. I tend to the other end, which is perhaps best exemplified by Winston Churchill, which is, to be paraphrased, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. <laughs> That's right, Matt. But of course, we like to knock it, don't we? Because we see so many, we see it abused quite a lot. But it's actually quite a, it's a very nice uh, concept. I, I think it, it is. Um, uh, we, we tend not, curiously, we tend not to think about it until mm. elements or aspects of it are removed. And uh, that's when we start to panic. Sorry, I'm very croaky, but um, I just finished the page proofs of the final volume of the trilogy last week. So I've been digesting relentless, undemocratic stories. <laughs> 
and uh, I think it's physically affected me. It's but, taken uh, its toll. <laughs> oh, you're like yelling at the computer and throwing things around and kicking walls? Yes, it's a bit yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. So it's taken a physical toll, mm. I can see. Um, so you've been pretty well immersed then. You, you've just done the proofs of your, 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 the last book in that trilogy um, in, in a political era of Queensland where the notion of democracy was, was tested. It was a pretty extraordinary few decades, wasn't it? Um, where the government and the police were behaving in a, in a way that I suppose undermined the idea of a democratic society. I mean, what, 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 how would you describe, I suppose, that notion of democracy and how was it um, abused in Queensland, if that was the case? Look, it's very, um, it's almost a sport to criticise Joe Bjorki peterson and the National Party. Uh, but when you study it to the uh, depths that I have, um, <clears throat> it's entirely... Um, appropriate. <laughs> um, the, the abuse of power uh, was quite simply astonishing. I had no concept of how far it reached, how, how deep it went, and um, how consistent the abuse was, uh, and that we allowed it to happen. We, as the democratic people, allowed it to happen year after year after year, until it quite literally sank under its own weight. Um, the inquiry, of course, the Fitzgerald inquiry, was <laughs> was almost an accident in the sense that um, if, if a number of perfect storms hadn't collided in May 1987, uh, we may not have had the inquiry per se. So um, fate dealt a hand there and um, we really needed a corrective, if you like, at that point. So you, you, when we had a chat earlier, you said democracy is a contract between the people and those elect and that that contract has to be clear and workable. What, what, how was the contract broken? I mean, you've, you've been looking at this pretty intensely. How, how did we get to that stage where the contract was broken in those, those years? Well, in really simple terms, there was uh, the appearance of government and then there was actual government. Um, they fed to the people what they wished the people to see and digest and they operated contrary to that constantly. So... Um, um, the Premier, uh, courtesy of um, people like Alan Callaghan, um, uh, Bjorki Peterson, was shaped into, it's funny to look at it now, but he, th this sort of facade of the sort of hayseed peanut farmer was a brilliant strategy to in fact divert attention to the real issues that were happening. Was it a con conscious strategy? I have no doubt that it was. Yeah. And um, uh, the southern press w could go away with uh, tasty comic morsels. And of course their sport was to constantly make fun of, of um, the backward deep north. This played perfectly into the hands of, of a government that didn't want scrutiny. Um, it got down to the point where um, in 1985-86 Queensland was the only state in Australia that refused to allow the National Crime Authority to set up in Queensland the only state in Australia, and you have to now wonder why. Um, they certainly understood why. Uh, and it would have, you would have thought that, that that was an act that was uh, bleed and obvious to the people of Queensland, and yet somehow, again, it went through to the keeper. So there's a whole book in looking at, at the electorate and why they thought and behaved the way they did, because in a, in a way they facilitated to some degree, and they were, they were a part of this whole scenario. Do you, do you think they or, or we, you know, enjoyed enjoyed it in some way, being so distinctive and a little bit, uh, you know, on the fringe, rebellious or different? Gee, I, I don't know. I mean, I I bolted from the state in '86 because yeah. I, the the weight of that was just ridiculous, and and I was receiving um, personal pr pressure from police because I was a police reporter and I'd done a sto some stories that had made them very unhappy. And they had personally targeted me and uh, followed me for, for weeks and um, let down the tyres of my car. car it's pretty frightening because it wasn't that long ago. No, that's right. Exactly. Uh, and, uh, you know, make no mistake, there are things happening today hmm. uh, that have eerie parallels to then. What, what's, what do you think it's done? So, you know, obviously... What, what do you think it's done for, for our understanding of democracy in Queensland? Do you think because of that we are... A we are a bit more sensitive, I think, to, to the workings of government. I'm, I guess I'm thinking of Campbell Newman, that one term, huge majority, 
suddenly just dumped. I mean, is that, uh, is that really the, a legacy of, of what Queensland went through? Yes, I think so. Um, I was speaking to a, a writer in uh, Perth, David Wish Wilson, whose his great desire is to write a true crime story in that state. And, and he said, because we've never had an inquiry like you've had, I don't have, uh, I don't have a starting point. I don't have any um, material on the public record. And um, as I was discussing with you, Ian, that, uh, I mean, make no mistake, the inquiry was just not about a few police copping a quid. That inquiry um, was open heart surgery on Queensland society. And we had to start from scratch. Now, it's only my theory, but uh, the, the shock result in January, when nobody gave the Labor Party any hope, um, I think the people of Queensland, because of what we've suffered and experienced and lived through, at the slightest hint of returning to those bad old days, uh, we respond, and we re respond very quickly and very strongly. Mm. And I think that's precisely what happened. Um, the year before, uh, in 2014, uh, uh, touring around doing events for these um, corruption books, um, I was asked relentlessly uh, if I thought we were slipping back to the days of Joe. And clearly it was, it was a topic that was on the minds of ordinary Queenslanders. So as a journalist, I simply wrote uh, an op-ed piece about this, saying that there is a perception that in some areas we're sliding back to those bad old days. Um, that column, 400 word column, elicited a 1200 word response from the government. Mm. Um, and from their chief media man, who said to me in no uncertain terms that the government was very unhappy with me. And uh, I emailed him back and said, if only your letter had been on the Premier's Department letterhead, I'd have it framed. <laughs> An hour later, he sent it back as a PDF on Premier's Department letterhead. <laughs> wow, that's cheeky, that's cheeky. So I emailed him back and I said, thank you for pr providing a small chapter at the end of the third volume of the Lewis Trilogy. <laughs> And, is it, and is I never heard back. <laughs> <laughs> Loran, Loran, what's, would that, uh, I mean, you were, you were the chief media advisor for both Beatty and uh, Bly. Would, I mean, your dealings with the press, if they made the government unhappy, would, would, that, would it go so far as to, to uh, sending off a, a notice like that? I can honestly say no. <laughs> I'm quite confident none of my missives have ended up framed, at least I hope not on any journalist's wall. Um, but that does go to one of the things of uh, one of the essential parts of democracy. It's about the freedom of press and it's about the ability of the media, uh, not just press but uh, broadcast and social media, to speak freely and to speak freely to power. And it's one of the things that Matt has identified in his work and here tonight as um, one of the things that became eroded in Queensland to all of our great detriment. How, how big a role does the media play in a democracy? Um, it, and is it playing a, a bigger role because a lot of what we know comes through the media. So the media has, as the fourth estate, has, the, has an enormous amount of power. Is it... Is it uh, has it changed at all in recent years? Well, I think, to take up the first point, the media is critical in a democracy. It's the fourth pillar in our democracy. It's um, absolutely vital. Most, most people don't meet their elected representatives. The only way they have contact with them, and in some cases the only way they can influence them, is via media of various kinds. So you need to have a vibrant, robust, healthy, cheeky media that is prepared to stand up to um, power. I think that's really critical. Uh, has it changed? Um, yes, it has, because of the proliferation of media. Um, journalists are under increasing pressure to do more with less across multiple platforms. Um, and Matt would know this better than I, but you know, having still been in the industry, but just the pressure that that puts on working journalists is enormous. Absolutely. And um, I just found this lovely old article from the late 70s this afternoon, Democratic Struggles in Queensland, by Hugh Hamilton in the Australian Left Review. And just Going to that point, he points out here that Bjelke Peterson has the largest public relations force of any government in Australia. Cabinet has the services of 54 salaried journalists. I mean, that is absolutely astonishing. I'm, I'm shocked. From the 1970s. Yes. And um, look, you know, the, the, the difficult thing too for journal working journalists today is I, I, I last year, um, had to contact um, the then 
Primary Industries Minister McVeigh, and I rang the phone number on the website, and I said, look, could I sp please speak to the, the press officer for the minister? And she said, uh, the woman said, no, you'll have to speak to the press officer's press officer first. Mm. So the press <laughs> officer yeah. had his own barrier around the minister. And it is this building of barriers ar around these protected species that, uh, that quite frankly, um, dilutes our, the power of our journalism. And yet, and yet the message, it's very, still very difficult for them to control the message, isn't it? And especially with the internet, things are leaked, people get around it, don't they? Um, so the, obviously the internet has a role to play in democracy now. I guess we're still not quite sh understanding how all that's going to play out, but I suppose in a similar role of the media. But it's, I mean, is it, is it diluting um, our idea of how governments should operate or is it you know, sharpening, the, sharpening it? It's um, from my perspective as um, working in government when the, media, when the internet became um, a big medium where a lot of people were getting their uh, news from, what the, what the internet has done has um, speed up and intensify the media cycle. So when we talk about a media cycle, it used to be that uh, across a 24-hour period you might have one media cycle, or perhaps two, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, where there'd be a series of issues roll through that you'd have to deal with and another in the afternoon. With the advent of the internet and multiple media and niche audiences, there are now dozens of media cycles every single day. And if a government becomes captive to trying to manage that media cycle, as we used to see in the 80s and early 90s in state governments in particular, it actually takes the focus off governing and they become hostage. That's a real risk. And, um, but thinking back before the internet and everybody could log on and you know, Twitter was there, Governments could get away with quite a bit, though, couldn't they? Now, I'm just, I'm just thinking there was a, I had a conversation with a mate of mine in Tasmania, strangely, just the other day, and I told him I was doing this talk about democracy in Queensland and is it different? And he said, oh, he was in 1994, so this is just before, obviously, Twitter, the internet, most of the internet was taking off. Um, Joe came down to speak to a, a group of uh, graziers in northern Tasmania. Um, as a guest, and, and my mate was one of the keynote speakers, and then Joe got up and started, and I was thinking, well, if that happened today, this would be on Twitter, it'd be everywhere. But what Joe was speaking about was an incident in his government, I think, or at least when he was Premier, where, I'm not sure whether you know about this, Matt, because I only just found out about it myself, and it's it interesting to me, where he'd, he said... Um, that he'd bought a lot of the uh, Agent Orange that wasn't used in Vietnam, brought it to the wharves in Queensland, shipped it out west, and then modified it uh, and modified planes and sprayed Brigolo's scrub to clear it. And it worked. And, they, and he had photographs showing all the brown Brigolo's scrub. Um, so he had a slideshow and he was speaking, and the, the speech apparently is available. I'm, I'm trying to get a copy, if I'll send it to you. But the audacity of that, but it would it it never made the news and it was never talked about it. I'd never heard about it and I did a bit of Googly and it never came up. I mean, those things were secret uh, until somebody recalls it now and you can dig back through. But I mean, governments would have been able to get away with a lot, wouldn't they? And that's, I guess that's a typical Joe story that... <laughs> yes, it sounds very Joe-esque, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to remember, though, that um, with, with Twitter and with the news cycle and with this apparent fabulous democratic instantaneous um, situation, that that in turn will affect the behaviour of the politicians themselves. And in fact, they'll be prepared for that prior to, uh, to um, their uh, sentiments being broadcast. So it probably works in both ways. It's sort of inhibitive and it simultaneously it appears to be very liberating. But I think it changes the whole dynamic. It was so refreshing to see New South Wales Premier Mike Baird last night on the 7.30 report, trying to urge a, d a discussion on the GST and said, well, look, let's, can we all drop the polit political point scoring and actually speak as representatives of our electorate? And I went, wow, I haven't heard that in a very long time. <laughs> I mean, that's, what, that's why they are where they are. Hmm. They are the, our public servants that we have put there and we tend to forget that. Are they able to do that? I mean, was BD or Bly, Loran, able to, to sort of ignore their <coughs> policy and media advisors and, and just stand up and talk? 
Um, sometimes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and some of us would be in the background holding our breath. <laughs> um, look, a politician is, a, um, uh, is always, um, when they're speaking in media, speaking in a public forum and they are to some degree, you know, on show. Uh, even Mike Baird last night and I saw that interview and it was refreshing to hear that. Um, he would still have thought through his comments and thought about how they would play and thought about what does, how does this advance his policy agenda, how does it advance his political agenda, and that's what politicians always do. And everybody has their own style. Mike Baird has a straight shooting kind of a style. Peter Beattie was more a showman. Um, that won't surprise anybody here, I don't think. And um, Anna Bly was, you know, a combination of um, very determined and warmly empathetic um, administrator. So everybody has their own way of doing it, but certainly um, I don't think very many politicians these days, to get back to Matt's point, step up before a camera or a bank of microphones without having thought through how they want to present, to which audience, for what ends. I'll just share with you one story about Peter Beattie. Um, when Q Weekend magazine first started, ten years ago, um, one of my first jobs was to do a profile on his childhood. No one had ever written in depth about what made the man and where he came from. Mm. It was a very touching story. So I flew to Atherton where he was raised by his grandmother. And in a small town like that, you get talking to people. And suddenly I had former pupils that attended class with Beattie saying that, oh, if we think he cheated, he shouldn't have got ducks. Mm -hmm. And, and um, he got thrown off the debating team for this and that. That's an incredible array of personal stories. So I did all the research first and I came back to Brisbane and I wanted to doorstop him, if you like, because I needed to approach him, in all fairness, to say, I'm doing this story and I would like some comment. So he came off the stage, a totally unrelated event. He was giving a press conference. And I approached him and one of his, not you, one of his press secretaries came to block me. And Beattie said, no, 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 it's fine. And I said, Peter, I've done a very in-depth story about you and uh, I would like to talk to you about it. He said, come up to my office. And we sat for 45 minutes. So just like that, um, all the barriers disappeared. And um, there were some tough questions he had to answer, but, but that was the sort of person I felt he was. I think I remember that. It's important, isn't it, that politicians do show that they're human. We don't, I still don't quite have a handle on Campbell Newman. Um, so with this, and, and, and it would be interesting, perfect time now for an interview with him to see how all that happened, especially in how the, the LNP government was handling uh, the election just before the election. I, I haven't really heard that story uh, being told yet. You know, we need, we need you to... You know, yeah, really I'd love, I'd, I'd, to I would love to tell that story, yeah. but I guess he's got a, a memoir coming out. Yes, yeah, Gavin King's year, doing so. it, so I'm a bit worried maybe <laughs> that it'll be a, a little bit of a whitewash, unfortunately. And, um, but, we do, we do, and, but Queensland does throw up. Interesting characters. Is it? Do other states do that? You know, Clive Palmer, um, Joe Beatty himself. Um, we, we've thrown up some really, really strong political characters in Queensland. Have they been allowed? Uh, does Queensland allow people to um, uh, act on their eccentricities? <laughs> and 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 is that attractive to Queenslanders? Um, I would say yes to both to both of those questions. I think that. Queensland has a um, unique political culture that has, or had for a long time, uh, been um, very, very interested in the strong man, premier president, authoritarian, populist leader. And if you look back through 100 years of Queensland governments back to 1915, you'll see uh, all the, throughout, all the time, you know, the um, Hanlon, um, Joe, uh, uh, Goss was an authoritarian leader. Um, Newman all fit perfectly into that mould. And that's partly, I think, uh, grown out of the political culture of Queensland. Um, and it's also, I think, a little bit reflected back. So, yeah, it's certainly... Queensland certainly offers more than its fair share of characters. I mean, you only have to think about what we've gifted to the national stage. Um, Joe for PM, Pauline yes. Hanson, um, Clive Palmer. <laughs> That's right. We've made I, a I think that's an incredibly good point um, about the, the big strong figure at the top. Um, and I've pondered this relentlessly and, and wondered whether it even indeed stretches back to Oxley in 1823 and, uh, and, and the Commandants and Logan. And you know the A-frame where, where 
recalcitrants were flogged. That's not very far from the executive building. <laughs> and I, I mean that as a serious point. As Queenslanders, for some reason, we seem to want a big daddy to tell us what to do. And, and I've had uh, friends from the south move up here and they go, what is it with Queenslanders? I mean, they get a parking ticket and they're all, oh my God, when is it due? And I better, you know, it's this sort of, uh, this sort of tenuous relationship with authority. Oh, interesting. Mm. Wow. Well, um, how much has that been enabled by the lack of an upper house in Queensland? Because the governments do have a bit more of a free reign here. They can get away with a lot more than other state governments. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think not having an upper house has contributed to, um, well, first of all, a very weak uh, institution in the lower house. If you don't have a house of review that you know is going to look over you, you can ram through any kind of legislation that you like. When you couple that with a political culture that is tolerant of, uh, very accepting of an authoritarian style of government, it makes for a pretty diabolical political situation. And that's why we saw... Um, uh, the uh, lower house, um, a very weak institution, uh, a very dominant executive, knowing it had no checks of an upper house, allowing a um, parliamentary committee system to wither away to absolutely nothing, very few parliamentary sitting days, long gaps in between, contempt shown by ministers in terms of answering questions without notice, partisan speakers, you know, I could go on, but I think uh, we've had, uh, we had, we did have, up until 18, 1989, a very weak institution, and then with Wayne Goss coming in, um, great credit to him, he actually rebuilt the institutions of this state. Do we need an, an, an upper house though? I mean, is it, is it something that we could, um, I mean, is, is there still that weakness or the potential weakness there? Is there another sure. institution that, that could uh, really, that really needs to oversee that somehow? The answer to that is a strong committee system. I don't think anyone is going to support reintroduction of an upper house. I don't think many people are going to vote for more politicians. <laughs> um, but if you have a strong committee system, a genuinely strong committee system, uh, it can work. And it did work in the, um, in the early Goss years and, you know, since. It has, it can work. And I think that people understand that more now because when we saw the Newman government sacking a committee overnight because it didn't like the answers that it came with, there was actually an uproar. You remember that, yeah. So I think that, um, as you mentioned before, I think that uh, Queensland, the Queensland electorate has become more educated about the importance of these things. There's um, a thread, narrative thread in the final volume of the Lewis books, which um, illustrates the, f the fraughtness of this. Um, Bielke Peterson had been trying to pass a major construction project in Brisbane from 1984. He wasn't getting his way with Cabinet. Come the end of 80, um, Seven. Uh, in order to get that building project through, he sacked five ministers and replaced them with, uh, with yes-men that would push the project through. It, it was really as simple as that. You, you remove the blockage and you put in um, the facilitators. That's really scary, I think. Did, was, I mean, we, we talk about Joe and, and that, I suppose, that, um, that uh, journey towards dictatorship. Um, did that start off? Uh, I mean, when, when did that, was that a gradual progression of a government that, that had and, and could keep control of power and, and because of that, um, con, that, that absolute control over power it became more corrupt? Was, was that a progression? Well, I mean, I guess from my reading and, and in <laughs> interviews with many people, um, you know, Bielke Peterson in 1970 71, his hold on power was pretty tenuous. Mm. He, was, he was in strife amongst, with his colleagues. Uh, and then along came the Springboks. And um, Joe utilised the powers of state of emergency. And he realised very quickly that the Queensland public approved of this very highly. Um, and he never forgot that lesson. That was the number one lesson that led to the road to, to what happened. Come 1977, well, we can go to 76, of course, with the installation of Terence Murray Lewis as Commissioner of Police. Uh, Bjelke Peterson had his fingerprints all over that, all over the dismissal of Whitrod. And indeed, um, a source has told me that um, the famous story of Bjelke, of Bjelke Peterson chatting with Lewis um, out on the airstrip at Kunnamulla after that country cabinet meeting. Um, 
when Ju uh, Joe flew off, uh, to heading back to Brisbane, um, Lewis walked up to a local councillor on the airstrip and slapped him on the back and said, uh, I'm packing my bags, I'm heading back to Brisbane. So that was the direct intervention of the Premier to remove a, uh, an existing police commissioner and put in Lewis. Now, you might think that's not much, but in Whitrod's seven and six and a half years as commissioner, on two occasions did he see the Premier one-on-one. Um, -on -one. In Lewis's diaries, uh, he records in the first three months of his commissionership, he saw the Premier 18 times. So you have an instant politicisation of the police force. Yes, it's an interesting character as well. How are you getting on with him lately? Uh, we haven't talked since last April <laughs> when he drew the shutters on the relationship. I can't wait to read the book. <laughs> um, um, I, um, the, um, what about the physical, what about the geography of Queensland too? I've always thought that that must have had some influence on politics in Queensland. It's very decentralised, but, but Brisbane and the, being right stuck down in the corner, um, uh, that must have had an impact. I know it's, it's thrown up a lot of political leaders that aren't from Brisbane, but what impact has the geography of Queensland had? Um, well, a few, I guess. One of the thing, one of the most important is that it contributes to this idea of political culture, which is the set of beliefs that people hold about their political institutions and their place in it, the way things are and the way things should be. And um, when you have a very large state with centres of power quite remote, perhaps you think that those centres aren't as important or that your place in them isn't very important and you develop your own local politics, your own local culture. But the other thing about the geography of the state is that it, it matters when you campaign or when you govern because, I mean, first up, you have to travel so much. It's further from Brisbane to Cairns than it is, you know, from Brisbane to Melbourne. And if you want to go up to the Torres Strait, it's another plane ride. Or if you want to go out west to one of the major centres, it's a plane ride and a long, a long uh, car journey. So that is something that you have to factor into as you think about governing or seeking to represent Queensland. And then when you do govern, you actually need to think about Queensland in a very different way. Um, infrastructure is much more important in Queensland because of the big distances, but also because we have so many um, regional discrete economies that serve as economic powerhouses for those regions. They need to be serviced with infrastructure. So you need to think about Queensland in a very different way than you do about Victoria, for example, or even South Australia. And even WA, which is an, another geographically large state, doesn't have quite the same regional development as Queensland. And then I guess the final thing from both um, a campaigning and governing point of view is that each of these local uh, regional centres has its own discrete media market. So you have to uh, understand each of those media markets to talk to the people in each of those communities. So we have democracies within democracies, by the sound of it. And then yeah. the reason I well, we saw downstairs, you know, obviously the North... Queensland separation petitions, but also the central Queensland separation petitions. Um, uh, Matt, is that, is that, uh, is, is, what influence has that had, I suppose, that va those vast distances and those discrete communities had on, on the evolution of a, a Queensland democracy? Well, it's a very interesting topic, and my first instinct would be to say that, you know, if you're far away from the centre of power, then there's plenty of places to hide. Yeah, but, thought, um, that's one of my theories. I, I was in <laughs> air just on the weekend, in from Townsville, and um, as we were driving to air, there was this long, narrow, concrete bridge going towards the little township, and um, the driver said, oh, you know, this has, been a, this has been a hazard for years and years, and we just got the LNP to commit to building a new bridge, and he said, now that Labor are in, it looks like we won't have a bridge for another, possibly another three years. Mm. So that, that is interestingly how they think that, um, you know, we're sort of forgotten here. Um, it depends on who's power and, in power and who's going, is our local member going to go all the way down to the big smoke and support us? So it's, a, it's sort of a distended um, uh, view of, of their, their role in a democratic society in yes. an odd sort of way. Yes, and it also throws up interesting characters, doesn't it? Um, those uh, far-reaching electorates, I suppose, tend to be uh, have, have more interesting politicians who are a little bit more, um, uh, how would you say, I suppose, uh, rebellious. You know, and you've got Bob Catters, um, but not just the politicians, but also but the people too. When you go to North Queensland, you, you do sense that there are different attitudes. It's a different, it's a different country. Yeah, it's funny you should mention Bob Catter because someone spoke to me today about an incident he was involved in in 
Brisbane in 1985. Um, I won't go into that. It's rather sordid and it's before dinner. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but yes, it, we do throw up these extraordinary um, characters like Bob Catter. Um, Catter, of course, learnt at the feet of Bjelke Peterson in the 70s. That That's right. People on a national stage don't even know about, and let alone Clive Palmer. You know, and his uh, he he was the um, he was the um, acolyte of Sir Joe. So of course, that's um, right. Um, it's endlessly interesting. Gavin King, the mem the one time member for Cairns, I remember leading up to the election that Campbell won convincingly. Um, he had been a journalist, so um, and he'd been a journalist for News Limited. So I was fortunate enough to go back into our archive, which is digitised back to 1984. Yes. And so I just typed in byline Gavin King and up came all of these extraordinary um, opinion columns that he'd written for the Cairns Post. And um, one of them was about um, him uh, being in a cafe and his breakfast was late. And the waitress finally brought it and he wrote in the column, you know, if I felt at that moment that I, I would like to have stabbed her in the eye with a fork. <laughs> now, there were other columns that were misogynistic that were racist, and this guy uh, was the pre-selected candidate and won comfortably. So, yeah, you never know where these people are going to come from. No, no. That's a, um, you know, Lorraine, you've got a, a book coming up about political branding. I suppose politicians, or at least political machines, are very conscious, aren't they, of reputations now? Um, people, are, you still get odd bods, I suppose, <laughs> appearing in politics, but, and you'd think that the political machines would be a bit more careful, but maybe they don't have a great pool to choose from. But it's interesting, isn't it, um, how, uh, I suppose, how much political machines want to control um, uh, uh, what's said and, and the message, um, and are they doing that much better? I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's this, um, I mean, do they have, I suppose, do they have the, do they still have a pool of talent that they can draw on that can actually carry through? Yeah. Um, well, going back to the start of that, um, reputation is everything in politics. It's pretty much all you've got. Um, politics is like one of those products that you can't really experience until you buy it. You know, it's, um, you have to pretty much take it on trust and until you tick the box, get the government, and they start delivering or not. So. Um, in politics, reputation is absolutely everything. Uh, and if you um, are able to uh, develop a, a good reputation, you're able to convince the public that what you're offering is the real deal, as Kevin Rudd did, for example, in 2007, through what I think is a, um, was a very comprehensive, very carefully crafted and managed branding campaign, then you will get into government. But the difficulty then is you have to deliver in government. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, I think that both Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard and probably even Tony Abbott are finding that delivering in government is really very hard. Um, as to your other point about the pool of talent, well, there's been criticism um, uh, probably in the last couple of decades uh, about the diminishing pool of talent that's available and the need to get more real people, for want of a better word, into politics. And I guess maybe the answer to that question goes back to the question for tonight, which is... Um, uh, whether or not people are actually interested in democracy and uh, whether or not they feel like they want to participate. And that goes back to the way democracy is practised in individual jurisdictions, in state jurisdictions and federally. And I think if people feel that their um, democracies are running well, that their institutions are running well, that governments are responsible and responsive, then people will want to participate. So that's a long-winded answer, but... There you go. <laughs> well, we need the institutions there to back them up, don't we? And to almost yeah. explain, I think, to our representatives. Because after a while, I, I think, I really do think that power does tend to corrupt. After a while, people do drift. They're human beings. A bit too much power, and you can sort of end up uh, gradually evolving into a, another Joe Bjorki Peterson, I suppose, situation. I mean, uh, we need strong institutions. Um, yes, we do. Yeah. And and we also need, um, as Matt said at the start, we need uh, an electorate that is educated and that cares about democracy. I mean, democracy is an incredibly uh, precious but incredibly fragile gift. And sometimes I think too few of us uh, care about it and take the trouble to keep it intact and make sure that you know, we're going to pass on something to the next generation.
Um, Matt, you've, you've finished your third book in the trilogy. What's, it, what's the title going to be? Um, All Fall Down. All Fall Down, mm. okay. <laughs> Um, and uh, and what what should we look out for? I, I guess what sort of because you've you've really I mean more than anybody else I think you've uh, you've done some original research and tried to piece together that narrative, haven't you? About how it all evolved. Well, yes, Very valuable I, have, exercise. I have. And I've tried to 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 put the story into a logical narrative sequence, which I, we don't think we've ever had. No. Which is and I wondered why no one had ever done this this project before and I understand now why. <laughs> it has been a nightmare. But um, people have thanked me and said, look, now we understand why that happened in 1975 because you showed us what happened yes. in 1969 and so everything moves forward. Um, what has been shocking is, um, well, the number of human beings and families whose lives were shattered by this whole process. And I've, I've tried to, in a way, a sort of sub theme of the books that has evolved courtesy of the research over the years has been to restore the dignity to those people who tried to do the right thing. And uh, we have an example today of uh, a police officer called Rick Florey who uh, is facing disciplinary charges uh, um, because uh, he, uh, well, they're blaming him for leaking footage of police officers in Surface Paradise bashing a young man. Um, and he's the one being punished. This is the same scenario that has been happening, that happened with Lewis, Bischoff, the whole lot of them from the 1950s on. And it is um, devastating to see that there are some cycles that simply uh, are resilient over, over the decades. And people, readers have said to me, uh, would you, after you've done these books, would you please do a book on the Bielke peterson regime in the same way, to scrutinise it? from start to finish, mm. so we can understand what really happened with that. And there have only been sporadic books about Joe. I mean, his own autobiography is, uh, well, thin, to say the least. Um, and I think it would be, maybe not me, but I think it would be a very, very useful exercise to study that, that period uh, in great depth while people are still alive and can share the anecdotes. Mm. But this, is, this has been the situation with me. I've had several uh, major... Um, sources of information pass away during the course of the research because yes. they're now in their 70s and 80s. And, um, but I will say to Terry Lewis's credit, um, by giving me to those thousands of documents that he had squirreled away, hmm. uh, how he came into possession of many of them, uh, many of which were confidential Fitzgerald inquiry exhibits, I have no idea. Um, and indeed, he possesses his entire catalogue of police diaries, which are the uh, property of the state government. But nevertheless, um, I think in time we will, we will thank him because he has, by proxy, managed to um, uh, allow me to fill in some of the gaps in the history. Gee. There is still a lingering fondness for Joe in some quarters, isn't there? Um, and that, that's always interesting too to me. The people, are people still in denial? I mean, there, he was never, I suppose... Um, uh, convicted of corruption. Was he corrupt? Uh, was he corrupt? Yeah. Uh, I would have to say yes. Um, there's a thread in the new book that will um, raise a few eyebrows. And I think the fact that he knew of the police corruption from, the, from 1976 on, and he knew it in detail and did nothing, um, there are many, many forms of corruption, and I think that's one of them. I mean, he allowed for our democratic system to be entirely uh, corrupted for every arm of government, public service, it went everywhere. And this is what has astonished me in my research. Everywhere you look, the corrupt system had someone planted just in case an inquiry went down that line. Uh, it, was, it is just astonishing um, uh, the way that our system was, was warped out of shape. And I think we're still feeling the tremors of it today. Mm. Does anybody have any questions? A few people? Um, yes, over here. Yep. Um, the, during the BLP Peterson era, there was always uh, a fight between the Liberals and the Country Party. Now there's a formation of the LDP. How stable do you think 
the Liberal Party is. Is it independent or is it just following on from the country? Oh, is that to me or <coughs> to Matt? Doesn't yeah. Um, I think it's been an, an interesting merger. I think what we saw was um, with uh, Campbell Newman coming in as leader, a de facto admission by the National Party at that stage that their leaders weren't palatable to uh, the Queensland electorate, which I thought was quite interesting from the party that used to be the party of government. Uh, and then, of course, the Liberals um, held the leadership. Uh, that's reverted now to the Nationals um, taking control of the leadership and Liberals in the deputies' position. So it's actually going to be really interesting to see how that power struggle plays out because this is one of the interesting things and one of the different things about Queensland is the fact that we've had a three-party system really in this state and in most states it's two and the fact that it's the national party that's um, for a long time been the dominant partner. So I don't think we know yet exactly how this is going to play out because there was a short period in government and we're still settling into the LNP in opposition. It's going to be really interesting to watch those dynamics. Yes, yeah, so there's a funny anecdote um, which sort of illustrates this question. When Newman was cam on the campaign trail um, in uh, late uh, 2011, he uh, did a trip out west so he could acquaint himself with um, the Bushies and, and uh, those great Queenslanders out there. Mm. And um, we sent a, the magazine sent a photographer out to, to document this. And Russell Shakespeare, the photographer, got Newman in a field, in a ploughed field, in his checkered shirt and, um, you know, his R.M. Williams boots. <laughs> and there was, Ru there was Russell taking the photo, but Jeff Seeney was holding the light so that it wouldn't blow away. Yeah. I think that said everything <laughs> <laughs> about the relationship. <laughs> yes. The role of the police throughout... Oh, sorry about that. Yes, please grab a mic. The role of the police throughout Queensland's history, with Fred Patterson being bashed by the special branch under Hanlon's government, I think it was, and the dichotomy between the, the Protestants ran the Department of Justice but the Catholics ran the police force. How much has that sense of entitlement of power maintained the police force up to today? Is there still a sense that they can throw up candidates for Parliament, they can make or break governments to any panel member? Probably your area of expertise, Matt. <laughs> uh, look, I think, well, I, I was interviewing only the other day a former officer who was wearing his Mason ring. Um, Bischoff got in because it was the Mason's turn and stayed in for uh, many years too many. Um, I don't know what it is like beyond the surface of the Queensland Police Service today and I don't know whether the same swings and roundabouts are still at play, but um, um, Lewis, for example, and many other of those surviving senior officers have regular contact with people within the Queensland Police Force because the, the police service is one whereby it attracts generational um, occupation. So you have men that were, uh, that were in the force in the 50s and their grandsons are now middle to upper rung. So those loyalties still cling to the vine through time. And Lewis certainly, um, before Ian Stewart was appointed, had his um, candidate picked. It wasn't Stewart. But he certainly had his man and he knew that many of his friends would be very happy if that man got in. So. It's an interesting but a complex question because the past and the present are always swirling around and mixing with each other. At Lorraine, we were talking earlier <clears throat> about uh, the tendency for humans to form tribes. Mm -hmm. And obviously in politics, that's tribalism is very strong. But then you have these tribes within tribes and these groups. It's very hard to break. Is it a part of human nature that we're going to have um, you know, groups wanting to maintain power? And that, that corrupts the system. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, one of the things that Fitzgerald talked about in his report was the police culture. Mm -hmm. Now, every organisation, every profession has a culture, um, but I guess it's whether or not it's healthy mm -hmm. and whether or not um, a culture of an organisation like a police force, as it then was, is doing what it should do in a democracy. And I think, you know, arguably it was not. 
Uh, and so it's important for all of us to be on guard to make sure those kind of cultures, that kind of tribalism, doesn't exist only to serve itself when it's um, in a police service or an executive or a parliament or the judiciary, wherever it may be. That's right. Um, yes. Um, Sorry, microphone. Oh, yes. right. yeah. Well, just as a sort of contrarian um, view, Tony Rees, the crime writer, and I used to sort of talk about corruption in uh, Queensland a bit. And I think one of the things Tony said to me was that um, Queensland was branch office for corruption in New South Wales. So I guess my question, my variation of Tony Reeves' position um, is that Brisbane is simply Sydney writ small. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew the late Tony Reeves and he was a wonderful journalist and a wonderful friend. Um, but I would have to say to you that I have a completely contrarian view to that, as described to me by police and by criminals that I've interviewed. And the situation in Brisbane was the opposite to Sydney. Sydney, of course, they had major corruption, serious gangsters, uh, you name it. Brisbane, yes, infinitely smaller. The difference, though, here, as explained to me by men involved in the, the so-called joke or corruption system, was that the police ran it here and the criminals were employed by them. <laughs> that was the difference. In Sydney, you're, you're on your own. You're the Lenny McPhersons, you're the Abe Saffrons, and in a very democratic way, you're making a living. But up here, the crime was controlled by the police in order to bring in the income, and the criminals brought in that income. And that, that has been told to me time and time again. That's how the joke actually worked and indeed survived uh, for so long. Astonishing. Yes, up here. I'd be very interested to know when the books are coming out. Uh, from each of you. I'd also like you to explore a little bit more the psychology of that authoritarian male figure. Um, I was one of those many students who in my um, 20s was arrested by a very large, robustly violent policeman. And um, I really agree that there has been a great deal of suffering from this. And one of the things for me was that um, I became so anti-authoritarian in my youth that I was actually, I think, bordering on sociopathic and I really think I was a product of, of those times. And it took me a while to actually work out how to be a nice human being and to actually trust really anybody in authority. And I think that's quite an interesting thing. Today, I think I'm quite well balanced, but it took me quite a <laughs> lot of effort. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think the, the uh, genesis of this authoritarianism probably goes back to the U European history of Queensland. Moreton Bay was established as a secondary uh, place of punishment, a penal settlement where people who'd been previously transported to places in Sydney or others had committed a crime, came up to Queensland for extra punishment. And it was known as the flogginest place in all of the colonies because of the harsh punishment that was meted out. Um, and in addition, it was, it was probably the worst of the frontier kind of mentality in Australia in terms of relations between Europeans and Indigenous peoples. So you had that, that kind of a history to start with. And then Brisbane developed as a very um, male-dominated, um, reckless, even violent, in the words of Ray Evans, who's a fabulous historian. If you haven't read his History of Queensland, I recommend it. Uh, so we had from the beginnings of European history um, a frontier mentality, a um, violent, thread, violent thread running through, quite male dominated. The ratio of men to women was um, hugely out of whack. Uh, so we had then, I think, the development of um, a core of the political culture that has persisted down through the, through the decades. And that, 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 um, that's the kind of culture that is accepting of uh, authoritarianism. That's my answer. Yeah, it's, it's um, fascinating to hear your story and how it's, you still feel it today, which is what I was trying to explain before on many different, with many different people on many different levels. I mean, in the 1960s, there were eight females in the police force, eight. Whitrod came in and tried to turn that upside down, and he wanted more women in to dilute a deeply misogynistic police force. Um, 
he promoted, for example, Laurel Saunders to be the first female detective in the history of Queensland. Uh, what happened to her was she was framed on a fake uh, attempted murder charge, uh, imprisoned for eight months, bashed by prison warders, and gave up her career in the 1990s, defeated. So if you were a woman in the Lewis regime and you tried to be honest, that's what happened to you. So, um, but it is very disturbing that, um, that these echoes continue to, to come forward and have a presence today. Um, I've had a discussions with a number of serving young female police officers in Queensland, incredibly talented, unbelievably smart, educated, degrees coming out of everywhere, and uh, it's still a difficult place for them to work. What about in politics? We have a fairly strong, I uh, suppose, um, a number of women in the current uh, state cabinet. Um, are we, are we, we, we must be transitioning at the moment in a, through a, an era, surely. In the few years, in a decade's time, we might look back and say, isn't that amazing that there are only that many women in parliament? Perhaps we will. Perhaps we will. We currently have eight out of 14 women, which is um, the most of any uh, in state cabinets around Australia, which is a pretty remarkable thing. This has happened in Queensland. We also have a Premier and a Deputy Premier who are women. Amazing. We had the first female opposition leader elected into office in Australia. <clears throat> this has happened in Queensland. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> so perhaps we are. Perhaps we are starting to see a a shift in political culture. And this is actually part of a theory that um, I'm working on with um, my colleague Chris Salisbury and Simon Kelly from UQ. We're actually we're investigating whether or not we're seeing a different style of political leadership in Queensland that might in explain in part what happened to the Newman government. And that is less of a, you know, le less being in love with the strong man image and looking for a bit more nuance in leadership. So looking for perhaps still, you know, a reasonably strong leader, but perhaps somebody also who uh, is prepared to listen and consult and be empathetic. And I think you saw that contrast between Newman and Palaszczuk in the last election campaign. Newman perfectly fit the Premier President, whereas Palaszczuk was much more approachable, consultative and open. And against the odds, she won. So that's just a theory that is in its genesis. Happy to take any feedback on that. Yeah. Um, well, how does Anna Bly fit into that, though? Because she was... I mean, I, I, nobody really complained about her, but she was dumped for this strong arm, Campbell Newman. Sure, yeah. I mean, there were a few factors, I think, around um, the Bly government going out. One is length of duration. Labor governments have been in yes. for 14 years. Long-term governments um, inevitably decay in some way or another. I think the big thing for Anna was the issue of trust around the asset sales. There were a lot of people in the electorate who felt um, let down. Uh, some of them, uh, a lot of them on the Labor side, felt extremely let down from traditional blue-collar supporters through to um, people on the left who held it as an ideological point of faith. So I think that was actually critical for Anna. In terms of her leadership style, part of this theory that we're working on in, about a leadership model in Queensland goes back to Beatty, which suggests that perhaps in Beatty we see the first melding of strong leader and more emotionally attuned, because Beatty really was, he was a strong leader. But he was also very much an everyman and very empathetic and could talk to anybody and consult, you know, till the cows come home. Um, and, and Anna was uh, a very determined leader, uh, but also she was very engaging and warm and empathetic. So we're starting, we're playing around with this idea that perhaps we're moving into a new model of leadership. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, so would you say that a uni... <laughs> so would you say that a unicameral democracy uh, could really just collapse into an authoritarian into an authoritarian government? Yes, just read Matt Condon's books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the collapse took a while, but yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, that, there's a track record for that right here, where you're living. Uh, one more question up the back, yes. Um, just a comment. Uh, with Newman's style of leadership, did the federal government adopt that? Did Tony Abbott adopt that? Uh, I think Tony Abbott's got his own style of leadership. <laughs> I think Tony Abbott 
um, was a, a good, in inverted commas, opposition leader for what his job was. And his job was to bring down a Labor government. And he did that by being relentlessly negative and opposing and simplifying things down and honing in on the things that were troubling people. Um, taxes, um, debt, asylum seekers. And that was his job in opposition. I'm not sure that he's made the transition from opposition to government. And that's a really big transition and requires a very different leadership style. And I don't think that we've seen that yet. Occasionally you see flashes of him, I think, grappling with government and trying to rise above being, you know, Mr No, but I don't think he's there yet. So um, I think it's a different leadership style to Newman. So I think Newman was always um, can do, you know. He was always the, the guy who would get things done, build stuff, make things happen. And he was really true to that. I call it a brand. He was really true to his brand and his leadership style didn't really vary from Lord Mayor through to Premier. They did try a little bit when he did the Operation Boring um, which was in 2014. They realised the polls were terrible, the public opinion was against them, they'd managed to antagonise pretty much every interest group uh, that there was. And um, so the government introduced something they called Operation Boring, which is just to bring the temperature down, keep Newman away <coughs> from, from conflict and, and cameras where he would be seen as you know, hostile or aggressive or um, authoritarian. Uh, but as soon as the campaign um, was on, he reverted to type. Yes, Matt. I really think there are some distinct parallels between um, Newman's very short three years and Abbott today. Uh, and I think Abbott would be very wise to study what happened to Newman because uh, on a couple of, of points, as we remember, the Newman government's very first act of government was to, uh, to abolish the literary awards. Um, Senator Brandis is currently um, wreaking havoc with the Australia Council as we speak. You've got this sense of entitlement. You've got Bronwyn Bishop just yesterday. <laughs> it is, you know, a, a one hour drive to Geelong. She gets a helicopter. This is a mindset that these people seem to have in their DNA when they get elected. This is where Newman and his cohorts fell down because after the long time in the wilderness, we are finally back to where we belong and we're going to take what we want. It doesn't work anymore. It's 2015 and I think that's on the nose with voters. I think we're changing as an electorate. I think we're more suspicious of what our politicians are doing on our behalf. I really do. And um, I think Abbott should be very, very careful. And I think they'd all be well advised to read both your books when they come out. <laughs> um, now, we've run out of time. There is a fantastic exhibition upstairs that you can't see anymore, but if you had the chance beforehand, it was fabulous. You, there are some exhibits up there. There's a really nice one of um, Joe the rubbery figure lying in state, and there's the original manifesto of the first Labor government of the world. So, very interesting. Unfortunately, if you didn't get a chance earlier, we can't go back up there again to see them. But obviously, if you come back to the library, those things exist and you can, you can have a look yourself. Um, and if you have any more questions, I'm sure Loran and Matt will be around for a few more minutes. But if you thank with me, um, Matt Condon and Loran Downer for coming in today. And yes, feel free to mingle for a while and then the library staff can go home. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, just. Oh, I just, yeah, I did a little festival up in the air and, um, it was, oh, it was fantastic.